This is a special one-hour edition of 17 News at Noon. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Nicole Kitsky. Well, we are tracking breaking news out of central Bakersfield where police are searching for a man accused of killing a child. Just for six this morning, officers responded to an apartment on San Dimas Street near Homemaker Place for reports of an eight-year-old girl not breathing. They found the girl had obvious signs of trauma. She was rushed to the hospital where she died. Well, police are looking for Clint Mason on suspicion of murder. He was last seen wearing a black hooded sweatshirt and he walks with a limp. He has family in Los Angeles and police say he may be trying to travel there. If you see him, you are asked to call police at 327-1111. Well, now to the latest on the coronavirus. Kern County has its first case of COVID-19. Well, here's what we know so far. That patient is not from Kern County, but was visiting here. That person didn't have symptoms when they first got here. They tested positive at a local facility. We were notified that a non-Kern County resident while visiting Kern County has tested positive for COVID-19. Public Health is still trying to determine whether the patient got the virus in Kern County or while somewhere else. Officials determined that the person had direct contact with five people. None of those five have shown symptoms, but they've still been self-isolating. The patient is also placed under quarantine in a home in Bakersfield. And the city of Shafter is the latest in Kern to declare a state of emergency in response to the coronavirus. It joins Solano and Bakersfield in the decision. Declaration means all events scheduled at city parks and other city-owned facilities are canceled through April 14th. The Shafter Animal Shelter is closed to the public and pet adoption suspended. And city buildings are closed to the public. You are encouraged to call for services and make payments online for water and other bills. Well, Kern joins a growing list of counties in Central Valley reporting cases of COVID-19. Even through the Public Health Department doesn't consider this to be a local case. We'll take a look at this map. Nearly every county around Kern has reported at least one case, with the exception of Io and Kings Counties. Tulare County reports at least four cases, with one patient said to be in critical condition. In Los Angeles, meanwhile, 50 new cases were reported yesterday, bringing their total to 140. Now, this map doesn't include the Bay Area, where about 7 million people are under mandatory shelter in place orders until April. Well, let's send things over now to Kevin Charette with a look outdoors. Kevin, how are things looking? Well, Nicole, just a reminder, uh, I'm at home and I will be at home giving the forecast until further notice because of the coronavirus and the recommendations that we should uh, separate ourselves as much as possible. So uh, I will be doing the forecast uh, from home until the f uh, foreseeable future. The weather is uh, nice out there. We've got a few clouds, but overall it's been a nice morning and uh, we've got a little bit of cloud cover uh, into the uh, Tehachapi area as well. Uh, but no rain. I'm not expecting any rain today. As we take a look at the temperatures, uh, for this afternoon, we will be in the upper 50s. And then uh, throughout the night, by midnight, we'll be back into the upper 40s. And then for the Tehachapi area, it's going to be a cool day for you. You're going to be in the 40s and then back into the 30s tonight. We are tracking another storm, a weak storm to the north of us right now. It looks like that may bring a slight chance of some showers into our area tomorrow. But we've got another storm that will bring some heavier rain coming in for the weekend. I'll have the very, detail, very latest on that storm coming up in just a little bit. Back to you. Thank you, Kevin. It looks like you're roughing it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, schools in Kern County are closed, and that makes it difficult for many parents to provide a meal to their kids. As 17's Taylor Schaub reports, the Kern High School District is offering free meals as parents are preparing for this major change in their child's lives. This morning, families from around Kern County will face a new reality. Kern's nearly 190,000 students will jump to online schooling in an effort to curb the spread of the coronavirus. We delayed taking this action as long as possible because we serve a different population here in Kern County. Now parents and children alike will have to adjust to prolonged homeschool and a lack of a lunch program. 73% of our children are eligible for free meals. 30% of the children in Kern County live in poverty. Very few of these children have access to the devices 
that would be needed for distance learning. And with many dependent on free school lunches, one district has stepped up with a solution. The Kern High School District and the County Superintendent of Schools are offering free grab-and-go meals to students. Meals will be uh, packaged for the day so that uh, person, uh, parents and, and community members can come up and pick up the food. KHSD says those meals can be found at all of their campuses Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Students have to be in their car with a parent to receive the meal. The meals are offered to any child under 18, and if your child has special diet needs on file, you have to call the Nutrition Services Office. We recognize that um, when school's not in session the five days a week, students lose their ability to obtain a breakfast and a lunch. A huge relief for many parents as they try to navigate this new normal. And many other districts are also working on their own meal distribution plans. You can contact your district or school for more information. And also the Boys and Girls Clubs announced that they are opening up meals to all people 18 and under. Just visit KEGT.com for a list of the locations. Well, today could be the beginning of a five-month summer break. Governor Gavin Newsom made bold statements about when your child might head back to school, and it might not be anytime soon. Nearly every student in the state is out of school because of COVID-19. Local school office officials are hoping to start back April 14th after spring break. But as with a lot of stuff going on right now, the situation is fluid. Yesterday, Newsom said students might not be back in classrooms until next school year. Don't anticipate schools are going to open up in a week. Please don't anticipate in a few weeks. Newsom says daycare and child care centers should stay open to alleviate the pressure of child care needs facing people out of work. And today, Governor Gavin Newsom issued an executive order to protect the most vulnerable California residents during COVID-19 outbreak. The order extends the eligibility period for important safety net services and ensures that California's most vulnerable residents can continue to receive health care, food assistance, and in-home supportive services in a timely manner during the COVID-19 outbreak. The order waives eligibility redeterminations for 90 days for Californians who participate in Medi-Cal, health coverage, CalFresh Food Assistance, CalWorks Cash Assistance for Immigrants, and In-Home Supportive Services. Well, let's take a trip around the nation. West Virginia joins the list of states infected with the coronavirus, bringing the total impact of the virus to all 50 states. West Virginia is the last to confirm a case of the coronavirus. Yesterday, West Virginia Governor Jim Justice addressed his state about preparations, repeating strategies from across the U.S., asking all to stay indoors if possible, with many now adjusting to work, home, and self-quarantining. And coronavirus continues to spread worldwide, but new research suggests a glimmer of hope. Young adults and children may not be impacted as severely as others. Well, in a mad dash to fill the void, a Texas company is stretching its operations to produce makeshifts, hand sanitizers, and looking to produce other products in the near future. And if you're self-quarantined but need to meet with a doctor, an app is helping you avoid self-interaction. Your 17th Health Watch is right after the break. Welcome back in your 17th Health Watch. More research is suggesting that children infected with COVID-19 are showing less severe symptoms than adults. Chinese researchers looked at suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 involving over 2,100 children. They found that the majority of the cases were mild. About 6% of pediatric cases were considered severe or critical, compared with 18% of adults. The scientists say they do not know why the children are not as ill as the adults. And a Texas company is shifting its focus amid hand sanitizer shortages during the coronavirus outbreak. Custom Chemicals and Coating normally produces salt and brine remover, but in just a few days, the company was able to change its production line and make thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer. The owner says he's distributed to local first responders already and plans to expand to the general public soon. But he says he's getting the raw materials to keep going could be a challenge. So much emphasis on social distancing in light of the coronavirus outbreak. It can leave a lot of questions about what to do if you start to feel sick. One option that many people appear to be choosing is a virtual doctor's visit on your phone or tablet. PC Mike Wenlin shares a couple of apps that could help you get linked with a medical provider. 
Teladoc connects you with a board-certified doctor 24-7 via phone or video. They can diagnose, recommend treatment, prescribe meds for many issues, including sore throat, stuffy nose, cold and flu symptoms, and respiratory infections. It's free for iOS and Android, though there are costs for connecting with the doc. Doctor on Demand allows users to connect face-to-face with the doctor through video on your smartphone or tablet. It works with or without insurance, available at reduced rates through many major health plans and large employers. Employers. The providers are licensed, board certified, US based, free for iOS and Android is the app, but there are again costs for talking to the doc. MD Live offers virtual doctor visits with board certified physicians from wherever you are, whenever you want. Users can schedule a non emergency appointment at a time and date that's convenient or have an on demand visit in about 15 minutes. It's free for iOS and Android, although there are again costs for connecting with the doc depending on insurance and other factors. Well, would you like more information about all of this? Not a problem, because I have built in direct links right here, pcmike.com. That's my tech blog. Till next time, I'm PC Mike Wendland for NBC News. Well, let's take another look outside and send things back over to Kevin. Kevin, how are things looking out there? Well, Nicole, we have a little bit of cloud cover out there. And again, we will be doing weather remotely until further notice. Uh, we will be doing weather until further notice uh, from my house here uh, because of the virus, uh, trying to keep that separation. But we've got the clouds out there and some sun. So we've got a mix all around today. Temperatures are in the 50s, 53 degrees uh, currently uh, out at Meadows Field. I've got 56 here in the southwest part of town. So overall, not about to start heading into the afternoon. As we take a look at uh, other temperatures around the area, we've got to the north, 43 in Delano, 53 in Buttonwillow, so still a little cool cooler to the north and then for the mountains 30s and 40s to hatchby 39 44 out of lake isabella skies uh, clear for the most part uh, in most locations but again we've got a little bit of cloud cover and that's going to be the case as we go throughout today especially on the west facing slopes of the tahatchby's and uh, we'll also be looking at some increasing clouds for tomorrow here's a look at the regional view and weak uh, disturbance to the north that is going to swing in for tomorrow bringing some cloud cover we may even squeeze out a shower there snow will be about a 4500 feet so maybe even a snow shower Temperatures uh, right for today will be right near 44 in Sacramento, 61 in Fresno, and then 60s down to the south, 65 into L.A. And here's a look at the big picture. And if you look to the north and the west, you can see a little rotation there. That is an area of low pressure that is starting to develop and will affect us as we head into Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. And that shows it on our future cast model one thing to note here is to the north, and that is the system that will roll through tomorrow, bring us a very slight chance of a shower. And then you can see out to the west, that other system gets organized Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, into Wednesday, bringing the chance of rain. Snow level with this will be a little bit higher, so uh, between 5,500 and 6,000 feet. So for the most part, we'll see a mix of sun and clouds today. That weak system brushes, brushes us for tomorrow. And then Sunday through Tuesday, it looks like right now, is the best shot of seeing some rain. And right now, we'll put between 10th, 1500th of an inch in the valley, between 1500th and 3 tenths of an inch for the mountains. Here's a look at today, and we'll look for temperatures to be right near 59 in Bakersfield, 60 in Delano, 56 in Taft, and then for the mountains in the Kern River Valley today, uh, we'll look for a mix of sun and clouds and 43 in Fraser Park, 40 in Bear Valley, and 51 out of Lake Isabella. For the desert, today looking for more sunshine, winds gusting around 25 and a high of 53 in Mojave. Your extended forecast looks like this. Tomorrow, the first day of spring, slight chance of a shower, dry Friday, Saturday, and then that next rain comes in Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And then for the mountains, uh, tomorrow, again, that snow level 4,500 feet, still keeping you cool in the mid-40s, and then warming you up a little bit Friday, Saturday. And then you can see Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, that snow level will be right around five to 6,000 feet. And then we take a look at the Kern River Valley forecast. Slight chance of a shower tomorrow as well. Mostly sunny on Friday. And then another chance of rain coming in Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So rain is much needed around Kern County in California. And it looks like we'll get a little bit more as we head into Sunday uh, towards the weekend. But in the meantime, we'll enjoy a little bit of sun and clouds around the area. Nicole. Thanks for that, Kevin. Well, things continue to change by the minute, but just in the past three months, a whirlwind of changes. But what has happened since we rang in the new year? We'll give you a look right after this. Welcome back. Well, right now we are in uncharted territory as the future and impact of the virus remains unknown. Well, so much has happened regarding COVID-19 in such a short period. 
As we all were excited about ringing in 2020, not only a new year, but a new decade. And China health officials noticed something strange regarding less than 200 patients. Well, that was 78 days ago, and now we're in the middle of a pandemic. It was New Year's Eve when Chinese health officials notified the World Health Organization about something peculiar. A patient was showing signs of pneumonia, but the symptoms were different. Something seemed new. A week later, China and the WHO confirmed a new virus belonging to the coronavirus family. Two days later, on January 9th, a 61-year-old man died from this new virus. Cases increased by the hundreds. It was spreading outside the country. Disneyland in Shanghai shut down. Lunar New Year celebrations were canceled. The fast spread even forced the city of Wuhan, the origin of the virus, to go on lockdown. By the end of January, the White House banned entry to the U.S. by most foreign nationals who had traveled to China. But the novel virus was on the move elsewhere. On January 31st, Russia, Spain, Sweden, and the United Kingdom each announced their first cases of the virus. The same day, the WHO declared a global emergency. As the calendar changed to February, new cases in other countries were confirmed. Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, and Singapore were just a few. Meantime, new cases were being reported in the U.S., including Los Angeles. On February 5th, the U.S. chartered a plane to evacuate U.S. citizens in Wuhan. Three days later, the first U.S. citizen died of the virus in Wuhan. On February 11th, the death toll topped 1,000. The same day, the WHO named the new virus COVID-19. The next day, 175 people traveling on the Diamond Princess cruise ship tested positive for coronavirus. The U.S. evacuated the American citizens on board. On February 19th, Iran reported its first case of the virus. Hours later, the country announced two people died. Two days later, Italy reported two people died. On February 24th, the U.S. stock market tanked for the first time. The Dow Jones dropping more than 1,000 points. Two days later, California announced the first case with no clear source of exposure. This is a fluid situation at this time, and I want to emphasize that the risk to the general public remains low. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle. It will disappear. On February 29th, the U.S. saw its first death to COVID-19. The man was from Washington and in his 50s. This is probably the tip of the iceberg. There's probably other patients who are getting this disease who are more mildly affected. On March 6th, Vice President Pence announced 21 people on board the Grand Princess cruise ship off the coast of California tested positive for the coronavirus. We are stuck in our rooms, but we are able to go out on the balcony. The cruise ship quickly became a symbol of the virus. It is our duty to help these people. The friends and families on board this ship by March 7th, 100,000 people were infected with coronavirus worldwide. The next day, the U.S. confirmed it had 500 cases. This is literally a matter of uh, life and death. And the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in the Central Valley. We're seeing a lot of action and a lot of fear right now because we're dealing with some unknowns. On March 11th, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic, changing the way the world thought about the deadly virus. We're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. At this point, 126,000 people worldwide were infected with the virus. 4,600 people died. Tulare County also reported its first case of the virus. But the big shock came last Thursday, March 12th. The virus was spreading faster, especially in the U.S., and extreme measures were being taken. Say, no large crowds, no long trips, and above all, don't get on a cruise ship. Professional sports were suspending seasons. Disneyland and Universal Studios announced it would shut down for the remainder of the month. Governor Newsom announced statewide recommendations and executive orders that impacted all counties, including Kern, which had no confirmed cases. 
BC and CSUB announced major changes. I definitely say I'm pretty scared. Classes were moved to online. But today we have announced that CSUB will immediately transition to what we are calling alternative delivery of our coursework from uh, this day until uh, the end of the semester. Over the weekend, long lines formed as people prepared for the worst. And I'm in line since like 6.20 this morning, hoping to get toilet paper and paper towel. On Sunday, March 15th, churches across Kern County shut down for service. And so there will be no masses after today for the next two weeks. Some churches turned to the internet, live streaming their services or posting messages on YouTube. This may be our new normal for a little while and we're kind of working through it and seeing how things go. Later that day, local school districts announced they were closing for nearly a month amid concerns. It's a minute by minute flow of information and we are responding as quickly as possible. It took 66 days to get to 100,000 cases worldwide, and it's been less than two weeks since then, and we're at 200,000 cases. Well, concerns continue surrounding COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the U.S. and Canadian border are temporarily closing to all non-essential travelers. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, President Trump says the U.S. will be temporarily closing the border with Canada due to the coronavirus pandemic. President Trump sent out a tweet this morning saying we will be by mutual consent temporarily closing our northern border with Canada to non-essential traffic. The president emphasized that trade will not be affected by the closure. Yesterday, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced he was closing Canada's border to non-citizens, American citizens and exempt from that ban. Well, hundreds of Americans are stuck in Peru after the nation closed its borders. Peru's president issued a 15-day nationwide state of emergencies on Sunday. Flights were canceled almost immediately. The U.S. Embassy posted a security alert warning Americans who did not reschedule their flights to arrange for lodging in the country. A State Department official says they have advised Americans trying to leave Peru to monitor the embassy website, enroll in the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program, and check with their airlines for updated information. Well, another successful rocket launch for Elon Musk and SpaceX. Shortly after 5 a.m. here, SpaceX engineers launched a Falcon 9 rocket from launch pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. This was the fifth launch for the Falcon 9, carrying 60 Starlink Internet satellites into orbit. The launch, however, was not without problems. Falcon 9 experienced the loss of one of its nine engines during the trip to space, but was still able to deliver its satellite payload into orbit. Today's flight marks the sixth time a batch of Starlink satellites have been deposited into orbit, bringing the total number of satellites to more than 350. When we return here on 17 News at 12.30, Bernie Sanders is reflecting on his campaign, what that might mean for the rest of the presidential primary campaign. Well, today, President Trump is holding a briefing to update steps being taken to help with the spread of COVID-19 coronavirus. During the briefing, President Donald Trump announced he's invoking a federal provision that allows the government to marshal the private sector in response to the coronavirus pandemic surge in cases of the virus. Well, Trump also says the Department of Housing and Urban Development is providing immediate relief to renters and homeowners by suspending all foreclosures and evictions until the end of April. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is providing immediate relief to renters and homeowners by suspending all foreclosures and evictions until the end of April. Trump announced in the briefing that he will sign those papers to invoke the act today. And also today, President Trump and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo spoke to discuss options for New York after cases exploded overnight. The president uh, I spoke to this morning, he's going to be uh, making arrangements to send up this hospital ship, uh, which is called the uh, U.S. Comfort. It has about 1,000 rooms on it. It has operating rooms. Uh, and the president is going to dispatch uh, the Comfort to us. It will be in New York City Harbor. Uh, this will be, uh, it's an extraordinary step obviously, uh, but it will, uh, it's literally a floating hospital which will add capacity and the president said that he would dispatch that immediately. The president also spoke about the mobile hospitals that the federal government has and where we could set up mobile hospitals where they come in with a 
uh, mobile hospital that has a capacity of 200 people, 250 people. Uh, I told the president that we would do everything we need to do to expedite siting of those facilities, and we're talking about a couple of locations now. And according to New York's governor, the state surpassed 2,300 cases with over 1,000 new cases. Well, in your crime watch, three men are behind bars for firearm and drug-related offenses during a probation search. According to the Kern County Sheriff's Office, around 8.20 Tuesday evening, deputies conducted a traffic stop on a black SUV in the 2500 block of Yellowstone Court in Wasco. Officers conducted a search of the vehicle and found a handgun, which was reported stolen to the Arvin Police Department. Deputies also located 12 grams of suspected methamphetamine, 11 grams of suspected cocaine, 15 grams of marijuana, nine shade vehicle keys used to steal vehicles, narcotics paraphernalia, a portable police scanner, and $167. 19 19-year-old Jorge Aguilar, 20-year-old Damian Torres, and 19-year-old Oscar Zuniga were arrested on suspicion of possessing a concealed firearm in a vehicle, conspiracy to commit a crime, participating in a criminal street gang, possession of narcotics for sale, possession of narcotics while armed with a firearm, possession of a stolen firearm, and possession of a concealed weapon while in a criminal street gang. And uh, let's take a look around town. Well, Broken Yo Cafe is set to offer its curbside service at both Bakersfield locations. Well, according to a release statement, customers now have the option to view a menu online and call in their order. The customer can pay once they are at the location with a debit or credit card while sitting in their car. An employee will drop off the customer's order in the back seat for no contact between parties. A Broken Yoke Cafe offers two locations, one at 7919 East Brundage Lane and 3300 Buena Vista Road. Well, taking a look around the state, the coronavirus has shaken the world and it can be felt in everyday life. Businesses are being offered to close their doors, schools are shut, and some jobs are at risk. Well, now millions of people are basically stuck at home. The threat of the coronavirus turning some cities into near ghost towns. A shelter-in-place order is expanding to cover about 8 million people in Northern California. And other places, including New York City, may face the same fate. So what is the shelter-in-place order? Well, the short answer is don't leave your house except for essential activities. According to the order in San Francisco, exceptions include task essential to maintain health and safety, getting mandatory services or supplies, outdoor activities such as walking, hiking and running, and caring for a family member in another household. As for many students, virtual schooling will replace classrooms possibly through the end of the school year. Officials say social distancing in general will help slow the spread of COVID-19, and some people have a glass half full view of the situation. The positive for me is it's, it's, if everybody does it, it's going to slow this thing down. Shelter in place orders have also have employment based exceptions. They include people who work in the healthcare field, grocery stores, gas stations, banks, garbage collection, and hardware stores. With many Americans temporarily off the job, the stock market on a roller coaster ride. The White House is pitching a massive stimulus plan that would inject a trillion dollars into the economy. We see Gabe Gutierrez reports. From the city that never sleeps, now on the verge of complete silence, to casinos closing temporarily along the Vegas Strip, to schools, shopping centers, and businesses empty coast to coast. Much of the U.S. is now staying home. New York City's mayor says a decision to shelter in place could come within the next 48 hours. I think New Yorkers should be prepared for the possibility of a shelter in place order. Many bars and restaurants here are devastated, no longer allowed to let customers dine in. Is it sustainable to just fulfill takeout and delivery orders? No. What's your message to President Trump? We need help now. Now. They're choking us slowly and taking the air out of us. Parents across the country are also increasingly stressed out. California's governor says schools in Los Angeles could be closed for months. It's unlikely uh, that many of these schools, uh, few if any, uh, will open uh, before the summer break. Small businesses in Austin, Texas, already reeling from the cancellation of the city's massive South by Southwest festival, are facing new restrictions. The service industry is devalued so much, but we will know in the next couple of months how important 
we are to, again, quality of life. Florida's governor refusing to shut down the state's beaches, which are packed with spring break tourists. The most drastic steps so far are in the San Francisco Bay Area. A sweeping shelter-in-place order is keeping 7 million people home for the next three weeks. But one area of American life still in play in some states Tuesday, voting. I think it's my um, duty as an American to come out and um, do my patriotic duty. Amid poll workers cleaning, primary voters mark their ballots in Florida, Illinois, and Arizona. A striking scene amid empty streets. New York's governor says infections might not peak here for about 45 days. Well, last night, New York Mayor Bill de Blasio announced a jump of 100 new confirmed cases. Well, Utah was struck by its most powerful earthquake in 28 years. This morning, the 5.7 magnitude earthquake rattled Salt Lake City, cutting off power to tens of thousands. Inbound flights to Salt Lake International Airport had to be diverted as workers inspected runways for damage. The quake was centered 10 miles west of Salt Lake City starting at 7 a.m. local time there. Operations at Utah's public health laboratory were halted as the business was assessed for damage. The state's coronavirus hotline went down after the quake, according to the governor, Gary Herbert, on Twitter. I have been in earthquakes actually in California before, and um, but I have never been in an earthquake when our general population is concerned about a pandemic virus. So that is, I think, new for all of us. Residents are being told to stay away from downtown Salt Lake City because of the potential danger of downed power lines and rubble. But at least six aftershocks had been reported within 20 minutes of the main quake. The mayor of Salt Lake City is warning more aftershocks are likely. Well, through the uncertainness, Bernie Sanders is now taking a look at his campaign. Could that mean he's taking a step back in the fight for office? And a carpooling service is working on creating safer opportunities for drivers. What steps are they taking? And in lieu of all the chaos around the world, one shop is spreading the gift of toilet paper. Your 17th Health Watch is right after the break. KGET Business Watch is brought to you by Grapevine MSP Technology Services, the Valley's leading IT service provider. Well, back now in your 17 Business Watch, let's take a look at the stocks. The Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 are all down at this time. Well, Bernie Sanders is reportedly taking a look at his campaign. The manager of Vermont, Senator Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign, says his candidate is going to be having conversations with supporters to assess his campaign. But he also suggests Sanders is in no hurry to make any decisions about leaving the race, noting the next primary contest is at least three weeks away. Around 67 million Americans think they will have trouble paying their bills due to coronavirus. Well, at Hub is out with an all-new coronavirus money survey. Some of the key findings were the new virus is a huge source of stress. 158 million Americans have started saving more money because of the pandemic. Women are slashing spending on travel, while men are spending less on concerts, sporting events, and movies. The survey found 94 million Americans have canceled or planned on canceling travel plans. And Lyft is exploring partnerships with the government and healthcare sector. The company wants to create safer earning opportunities for drivers by having them deliver medical supplies, food, and other items. Lyft is also advocating for policy solutions in Washington, which could include federal stimulus for drivers and other workers. And yesterday, both Lyft and Uber said they would suspend shared rides to help slow the spread of the virus. Well, the first confirmed case of COVID-19 is here in Kern County. What does that mean for Kern County residents and how can we protect ourselves? We have a doctor in the house to explain what precautions we need to take. We'll be right back. Well, this morning, we were joined by Dr. Hamal Kothari, the Chief Medical Officer for Dignity Health Center, California Division, to talk about what this means now that we have a reported case in Kern County. Dr. Kothari, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. So what is the significance of this new report yesterday? So, you know, we, we've all been waiting for this report to come by. Uh, we've been, it, it, surprisingly, it's been here a lot later than we expected, but it is here in Bakersfield, it is here in Kern County, and I think we will see more and more cases as we go forward. Does that mean that coronavirus is now spreading in Kern County? Um, I believe there's, there's definitely a potential for it to be spreading. Um, you know, and this woman's a prime example. She came to town with no symptoms and then tested positive. So 
We probably have other cases. We have cases already be, that we are testing um, at different places right now as well. And, and what do you expect to see in the next few days and weeks? I, I, I will hopefully not. If I'm, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I think we'll, we'll probably see some more cases coming through that will be positive. And, you know, we talk a lot about flattening the curve. Um, that's been the big discussion of why all of these closures are happening. Uh, school closures and asking restaurants to only do to-go service, those sorts of things. It's the uh, attempt to flatten the curve. Where do you think we are in that curve right now? Um, unfortunately, we, we are following the same trajectory that um, Italy did. And so we're still on the uprise right now. Um, and we have a ways to go to flatten it. And, but some of these measures that we are taking place right that are taking place currently right now will help with flattening that curve. So do you think we are going to be on the red curve there or the blue curve? Well, currently, we're still on the red curve. And what does that mean? Uh, we're still going to be seeing a lot more cases. Uh, we're still taking measures to get onto the blue curve. But unfortunately, these measures haven't come fast enough uh, that we already have exposures. What do you think people need to be doing then? You know, I think you just got to be smart. You know, we, we, we've told people from day one, you know, wash your hands, cough in your shoulder or in your armpit or shoulder, um, stay away from people, from bigger crowds. Uh, you know, just hand hygiene is the biggest thing. And also the, the, the most important thing is not touching your face with your hands. You know, we, we are in the midst of cold and flu season, and these things are, are recommendations that we hear for cold and flu every single year. Why are they more important uh, with coronavirus? So the, the biggest difference is coronavirus is what we call a more virulent virus. So it's, it attacks your system a lot more aggressively than the regular flu. And so it spreads a lot easier, it spreads a lot faster, and it it's potentially can kill a lot more people as well. So let's talk about the people who are most at risk for coronavirus right now. Um, we've heard a lot about the effect on the elderly, how people over 65 should self-isolate at home in order to protect themselves. Who else uh, is most at risk from this virus? So typically it'd be people that have, you know, one of the most common is people that have lung conditions. So people that have COPD, you know, those are at high risk. People that have asthma that's not controlled and or older, they're at higher risk as well as well as people that have a lower immune system. Someone that's actively going, um, undergoing chemotherapy for cancer treatments, they would be at risk, HIV patients. So anyone that would have a lowered immune system, unfortunately, is at a higher risk. And we have a lot of asthma cases here in Kern County. What about kids and young people with asthma? So that's one of the good things about um, coronavirus is it's not affecting kids as some of the other viruses are. So kids will get a milder infection and unfortunately, kids are more so carriers than actual um, getting the more likely than getting the disease. So that's that's one of the reasons where the hospitals have tried to limit the amount of visitors, and especially kids, to the hospitals because they can then bring the virus into the hospitals. And at Memorial Hospital, that's that's what you're doing. Correct. That is absolutely correct. We're not Memorial and Mercy. We're not letting anyone under the age of 18 come through. So these kids may actually have it and show little to no symptoms. Absolutely correct. And what do you do then if your child is showing just a mild runny nose? Should you should you go ask for a test? No. So what we're doing is, you know, one of the problems we're also having in Kern County is the ability to test everyone. We can't go around testing everyone. We don't have the, the kits um, to test everyone. And also, you know, the labs are very inundated, so we can't just send a bunch of tests over to them. So what we're doing is we're screening these people. So if the parents have symptoms, then we'll test them. And they have to have fevers, they have to have a cough, they have to have shortness of breath, then we'll go ahead and test them. But prior to testing them for COVID-19, we do check them for, virus, for the flu. We also check them for stuff like if they have a sore throat, we'll check them for strep as well first. So it needs to be seen in the parents first? Te yes, well, that's, that's the only ones we're checking. Okay, uh, and then what's your recommendation then for in the meantime for families with young children? You know, one, one of the things we're doing obviously is keeping them out of school. So it minimizes the exposure to other kids and who will then can potentially take it home to their parents and even worse to their grandparents. So I think, you know, closing the schools is, I think was a very smart thing to do. Um, and then limiting um, the 
area where the kids get together in as well. And then lastly, we were talking about those pre-existing conditions and those people who actually are more at risk from the serious effects of coronavirus. What do you recommend for them? I mean, we've gotten a lot of recommendations and things are being closed and we're asked to not gather in groups of 10 or more. Do you think that people who are in those higher risk groups should be taking more extreme measures and basically following the shelter in place uh, recommendations that we're seeing up in San Francisco? You know, I think what we've got to do is we've got to remember, we've got to keep living our lives. So be smart about this. You know, don't go around people, don't go around big groups, don't go around people that are coughing. Um, you know, and, and once again, just, you know, practice, you know, safe, hand, you know, your hand hygiene and, you know, protect yourself. Well, so Major League Baseball makes a big announcement on what they're doing to help combat the coronavirus. Well, the teams are stepping up to help combat it. Also, players across the nation are stepping up with donations. This time, a football player and his wife are getting involved. Those stories when we return. Welcome back. When a look at sports, Major League Baseball is stepping up in a big way. League Commissioner Rob Manfred announced that all 30 teams have committed $1 million to help ballpark employees impacted by the postponement of the regular season due to the coronavirus outbreak. The league delayed the beginning of the 2020 campaign by at least eight weeks on Monday. This after the CDC recommended events with 50 plus people should be restricted due to the pandemic. MLB continues to negotiate with the MLB Players Association about potential payments to players and figuring out how to compensate minor league players who received their last paycheck at the end of 2019 season and were only paid a per diem per during spring training. Well, also, Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson and his wife Sierra are doing their part to assist others in need during these tough times. The star couple is teaming up with the Seattle Food Bank to donate one million meals to help people struggling due to the coronavirus. This is the video they posted online. And the NBA season is already suspended due to the coronavirus outbreak, but now one of its players is infected. Kevin Durant and four other players on the Brooklyn Nets have tested positive for COVID-19, but only one of the players has shown symptoms. It's unclear if the player is Durant. According to the Nets, all of the players, including Durant, are in isolation and under the care of team physicians. Well, we'll be right back. Stay with us. If you're missing movie nights with friends during social distancing, Google Chrome and Netflix have a solution. It's called Netflix Party. The Chrome extension allows you to watch and chat with your friends from separate locations. All you have to do is download the extension, start watching a Netflix show, and then click on the NP icon on the table bar. It will give you a web address to send to anyone you want, though they need to also have the extension installed. The chat, then you can just chat the night away like you normally would. Well, thank you for turning in to 17 News at noon. We'll see you back here at 17 News at 5. See ya. 17 News, your local news leader, continues 24 hours a day on KGET.com and our 17 News app in the spirit of the Golden Empire. 17 News.